Stream Swamp Escape Ship Car Bet. Streams Swamp Escape Ship Car Bet. All of those ways of seeing have a kind of alternative way of seeing, which is kind of embedded into the way that people behave around projects and is not helpful. So streams, the idea that there's an existing value stream, all you need to do is construct it. Swamp, the idea that um, the space where you're building a project is um, not contested, that you can do whatever you want there. Escape, the idea that you should just hide what you're doing until the very last minute, that you should just keep everything inside where nobody can see it, where no users can see it until the last minute. Um, ship, that um, there are going to be no problems with your project, um, there are no problems going to appear on the horizon and anybody who reports them is wrong and bad. Car, that your project isn't going to need um, controlling, that isn't going to need empirical control like driving a car. And then finally, bet, which is the idea of a bet is that um, this project might pay off, but there's a chance it might not pay off and you lose all your money. And of course, the shadow view there is, but there is no risk here. There's no bet. There's no chance that this project isn't going to pay off and uh, we're going to lose all our money. So for those first six chapters, there's a relatively easy kind of dynamic. Well, there's a relatively easy discussion that you can have, which is to say, look, this is a useful way of seeing a project. And this is um, a kind of naive shadow way of seeing projects, which if you see things in that way, it's not going to help. And then in the final three uh, chapters, things get a bit more um, complex because um, in these chapters, well, certainly the next two, like the chapter about commitment and the chapter about symmetry, the symmetry one's pretty complicated. Um, the commitment one, basically, it's very difficult to paint a picture of what this right way of seeing is it's extremely difficult to paint that picture and the reason for that is because the kind of essentially the wrong way of seeing the shadow way of seeing is so powerful and so kind of like compelling um, so that is the idea of that projects are about consistency and commitment commitment consistency as it's called <clears throat> and the the thing about that the thing about that um uh way of seeing is that it's also pretty much what people think project management is about. People think project management is about commitment and consistency. That's what they think it's about. And so what I'm doing in that chapter, essentially, is explaining why commitment and consistency is such a powerful motivator for humans. And also, because of that, why it's used so much in project management, but also because the way it's used in project management, essentially what's happening most of the time is people are, are being asked to make um, commitments that they shouldn't be making. And be, they're being asked to be consistent about things that they shouldn't really be trying to be consistent about. Um, and I talk about this in terms of Ralph Waldo Emerson, another quote, um, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds and say that people shouldn't be caught in foolish consistency. And what I try and do at the end of that chapter is I try and explain what we really should be doing in projects to try and paint this kind of other way of seeing, but it's very difficult. And this other way of seeing is like rather than kind of like delivering on what we've promised, which when we're doing that promising, we're being manipulated in all sorts of ways because otherwise we might get, not get the work. That's one kind of problem with those kinds of commitments and um, being consistent with them. But another thing is, we're making those promises when we know nothing nearly about the product. We know nothing about the project. And so kind of really what we need to be doing is we need to be moving towards a situation where we're not focusing so much on what we promised, but we're focusing on what we can deliver that is valuable. And that's a that's a very different kind of thing. And in order to really, really explain that and make sense of it, I think you need actually 
um, the next chapter in my in my book, um, which is called Chapter All, and is about this kind of idea of symmetry and asymmetry, which um, I take insp inspiration from a Chilean psychoanalyst. Um, uh, and it's this idea that it sounds initially quite complicated, but it's actually in, a, in many ways very simple, but also like really powerful and really kind of you see the world in a different way once you've once you've got a hang of seeing it through this lens. And that's the idea of um, there being two ways of looking at the world. One is in terms of all and same and forever, again, three. And the other one is in terms of some and different and for a short space of time. Fat fingers can't fit on camera. And the point that I make in this chapter is the point that um, um, Ignacio Matt Blanco, who's this Chilean psychoanalyst, makes, which is that our subconscious mind tends towards the first, those, that first group of all, same, and forever. And, and so kind of subconsciously, we, we, we prefer that, we prefer all, same, and forever. And, and so any kind, of, any kind of move away from all, same, and forever has to involve conscious effort um, towards some and um, uh, different and for a short space of time. And there's another very closely related concept here, which is the idea of matching. So, so um, uh, Ignacio Matt Blanco calls this all same and forever, symmetrical thinking. And he calls um, some different and for a short space of time, asymmetrical thinking. And there's another aspect to this, which is this idea that things that are written down, things that are thought of, ideas, can somehow directly match the world. And both of these things, this idea that you want everything um, and it needs to be all the same and it's forever, and the idea that things that are written down can directly match the world, these things that are being kind of understood subconsciously these things are some of the biggest causes of problems uh, for project management because essentially what you need to do in order to make a project be successful is you need to you need to be using these other things these asymmetrical things which are you need a something you need something that does something for some people at a certain point in time um, and this thing um, will be different from typically one thing that is very often asked in projects is that something does exactly the same as something else um, that went before it, or it does all of the things for a certain group of people or whatever. This thing that you're doing will be a partial thing. It won't be, it won't be everything and it won't be all and it won't be the same. Um, and so the thing that is actually going to create value for you, the, like a successful project, won't do everything that it was imagined it would do. Um, it will take some time, so it won't be timeless. It will be a, for a space of time, it will do some things, and then later it will do other things. And then um, beyond that is this idea of an, a perfect match between the description and the thing. Now, if you start to think about it, this in itself is not hugely valuable. The idea that something a project that you have that works, that does something it's supposed to do, delivers value, it's valuable to people, it delivers value to the organisation. There is no inherent value in that being exactly what was discussed exactly. So there being a perfect mapping between um, the thing that was imagined and the thing that really happened. And there's a crucial difference between the thing that's imagined and the thing that really happened. And that is that the thing that really happens is real. It's a real thing that works in the world. It's not a description. It's not a dream. It's not an idea. It's a real thing that works in the world. And this brings us back to why commitment and consistency is so problematic. Because again, there is no inherent, in, there is no inherent value in doing exactly what you promised. The value is in the thing that is being produced. And there's also no inherent value in doing all of the things that you promised relative to a small thing that you that you promised. 
But with both of these, the thing that you're fighting all the time as you're talking about them is that the subconscious really likes the symmetrical things. So the subconscious really likes the idea that you get all the things that you're promised. The subconscious really likes the idea that what you promised exactly matches what happens in the world. But here's the interesting thing. The real world does not give a fuck. The real world just wants something that's valuable to its users that can actually work. And the way that things in the real world work isn't the way that lists and specifications and promises work. That is, that is essentially like a, a whistle-stop tour through my book. And the thing that I've been talking about as I've been discussing um, the conclusion is that these ideas that I talk about as the shadow ideas, they are kind of appealing. They do have, the, of course they're appealing because they slip into the subconscious without any kind of resistance whatsoever. Um, the work that you need to do when you're starting to do projects is to, is to start to realize that these, these are false friends in essence, these, these ideas that kind of like, what you need to do is to exactly map on the idea. What you need is uh, there won't be any problems on your project. And in the final chapter of the book before the conclusion, I talk about um, my realization that a project that's really happening is a project that has trouble and problems and embarrassment. And that that kind of dream of a project that has no problems is, is getting in the way, if you're a, if you're a boss, so the, the, the final chapter is, is for bosses, that this dream, this idea that a project is going to be something that doesn't generate problems and doesn't and doesn't um, have embarrassment and things that you need to think about, that you need to make decisions about, is getting in the way of you actually doing what you need to do, which is to deal with um, the problems. What I kind of say in that chapter is actually problems is one way of seeing them, but another way of seeing them is just data. This, this project is producing stuff, and some of that stuff might be, here's a new opportunity that if we jump on this, we can make way, we made this project way more of a success than we thought we were going to. So this idea of kind of there not being, uh, there not needing to be any problems um, is, is getting in the way of this idea of like expecting problems. And beyond that, this is the thing that is really difficult to paint and really difficult to explain. Beyond this kind of wave of difficulty and problems, which is essentially built into all the ways of seeing that I've talked about throughout the book, is is the real shiny thing, is the real attractive thing, is the real promising thing, which is something that's really of value to customers, that works, that is a real thing in the real world. 